Welcome to the seventh episode of Belgian Mole Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me once more is my fellow Brit who always walks out when two Mexican men join him in a sauna, Anthony Williams. Evening. Good evening. It was actually a struggle to come up with a, an intro for you this week because I was too busy going, I have no idea who the mole is. I have no idea who the mole is. I, I, I'll tell you, it got so bad today. I I broke my own cardinal rule today and actually delved into some of the mole forums because I have no idea and nothing could make me happier. I completely agree because, as you well know, I was watching the non subbed version last night. And as soon as the phone number clue came up, I started Googling that phone number. And there were so many people debating what it means. Annoyingly, everyone has a different theory and everyone has a different mole. Yeah, and, and obviously I did the same thing. But what absolutely blew me away is people were talking about this phone number before this week's episode aired. Yeah, somehow they managed to get it off the preview. No, even before that, um, they'd been it had been built up over, from episode one. They'd been picking up numbers each week um, because apparently in every episode there has been uh, a clue to a number, and as that clue appeared, you could hear a phone tone at the same time. Now I haven't spotted what? any of these, not not one, um, and I haven't gone back. But yeah, yeah, I was reading the thread today, and um, there was. Just debate over whether anybody picked up the zero at the beginning. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, it sounds like um, people have spotted it. So somebody figured it was a number about a week ago. Um, and the reason he spotted it is because the first four digits are the same as his mobile number. And they're the four, first four digits of one of the Belgian mobile phone providers. So he figured... Well, if those are the first four digits, I wonder if that makes up a, um, a mobile number. So he rang it and got a voicemail. Well, kudos to him. I will say that from my end, I can vouch that it is a real phone number and they do have WhatsApp. Because I haven't tweeted out this picture yet because I was deliberately waiting for you guys to actually watch the episode. But I have WhatsApp the mole just with a simple message saying, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> Not a clue. Not a clue. And if you go delving in the forums, you will find a really plausible theory for all three of the finalists, which is just delightful. It's brilliant. I was so confident going into this episode it was Lloyd. I knew Pascal went this week because a certain blabbermouth Mr. DaCosta Instagrammed <laughs> a picture of the final three right after the episode aired. <laughs> Not going to mention that at all. Not a spoiler once it's aired. It is when it has the caption, the mole is a man. You know the rules. I know, I can't even <laughs> moan about this, but at least it subscribed to our theory from last week that it was going to be the final three old guys, but I was slightly irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I hadn't seen that, because going into the test, I was like, whoa, we were wrong. Clearly Pascal's getting through because she's got all this extra information. But no, although I am... Fairly confident that she has got the right mole, she just didn't get enough questions right. I think that was left in deliberately when she left. I think so too. So, previously the final five played Wheel of Fortune and party games to earn cash, but a gamble by Lloyd sank them. They tested the mole with punishments and Bambi, before herding goats in search of an edible exemption. At the execution, Pascal was safe, but Gioka saw the red screen and was the next person to leave. And before the credits even roll, we find out that our theory about the mole books returning finally is true, and they return with hidden numbers. Yeah, well, we knew it was coming, um, but I didn't know in what format it was going to happen. So, yeah, it was a really exciting start for me. I was like, yes, mole books, come on. And then we had to go through a whole different assignment first. I'm kind of proud of us that we actually managed to guess that the mole books were going to be the secret. Yeah, I mean, it was clear that they were going to have some big part towards the end it was just incredibly satisfying for me and i was sat there going oh my god the mole books about we were right yes <laughs> one prediction that we make about belgian mole is finally correct yay we get something right this season probably not the mole but hey and the candidates have driven from puebla to playa de chachalacas uh, on the gulf of mexico for the final part of the trip and we get a rundown of everyone and whether they are the mole and it's incredibly um Prescient timing, shall we say, that they were in Puebla at the start of the episode, because, if I'm not mistaken, that is the whole reason for Cinco de Mayo. Oh, really? Is that where it started? I don't know how I heard this, but apparently Cinco de Mayo commemorates the um, the Battle of Puebla, when Mexico beat France. 
Mm, okay, and it, and it aired on that weekend. And it aired on that weekend. I'm I'm assuming it's the same Puebla. I'm probably wrong, but I'm assuming it's the same Puebla. Makes sense, doesn't it? And the rundowns begin with Peter. Is it a priest? Peter is good-natured but cost a lot at selected moments. Is he a guardian of the group or a traitor? Then we have Baha, who, despite his job, hasn't earned much money, and he's always in the right place to sabotage. Is it Pascal, who's friendly and discreet? Spoilers, no. Is a riddle really that hard for a marine officer? Or could it be Lloyd, the youngest of the group, who in an all-or-nothing moment won nothing, and he's an incredibly impulsive mole? What are your thoughts at this stage? Well, one of those adheres to a hint that I thought about, so I'm, I'm going to restrain myself for a few more minutes. We have to get to sort of two-thirds of the way into the first challenge before I'm really going to reveal what I think. So what do you think? At, the, at that stage, I'm thinking, oh, it can be anybody. It really can be anybody. There's nothing positive. And from the minute this episode started, my, my faith in Lloyd just disintegrated really, really quickly. And I can't quite put my finger on what it was, but there was just something about it that just made me question it. <laughs> You just made me question everything, Michael. See, it's really odd because I've mentioned a few times that my record with Belgian Mole is horrifically bad. I've gone into both of the previous two finales thinking, oh, I know who the Mole is, and they've ended up winning the season. And it's been my least suspected person who's been the Mole. So going into this one, I'm thinking, finally, I'm on the right track. And then we get the whole confusion over the phone number which is really irritating because if it does end up being Baha, I've put zero points on him again (laughs) I have no idea who it is anymore and that is both a wonderful feeling and a dreadful feeling when actually we're supposed to be very good at guessing this I've never claimed to be very good at guessing this and I like that I'm not (laughs) The whole modus operandi of this podcast is being know it alls, <laughs> and we know nothing. <laughs> no, I, I think the I think that role has been filled on other podcasts, so we're fine. We're the know it nothings. We really are. We're the know it less. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like we're going to have to bring in some support to just help us with this. I know Logan's back on Thursday. I don't think it'll be enough. He needs to bring a best friend with him. I think he does, um, and I think, you know, there needs to be someone who just knows more about this show than any of us, because clearly we're amateurs. Clearly we're rubbish at this. Yep. So in the first challenge, uh, they are the first and possibly only participants in the Mole Triathlon, a one kilometre kayak, a 12 kilometre cycle, and a seven kilometre run, and if they get three people across the line in less than three hours, they win 500 euros. Along the way, they will receive choices either mini challenges for an extra €1,500 for the potential pot, or something to make their journey easier. The first two challenges will be done in pairs, and the last one by all four of them. And Pascal and Peter decide to kayak, and Lloyd and Baha decide to pedal. And while the other pair is doing something, the remaining pair has to do their own mini challenge to try and help themselves in the next one. So, did you notice how eager Lloyd was to do the cycling? That felt a bit interesting. It felt weird, but also, if I was in his position, I would want to do the cycle as well. You're a cyclist, so it does kind of make sense. But it just seemed like, out of nowhere, it was like, I'll do the cycling. Like, he knew that that would be a good thing to do. I don't know. I do like cycling, but also, I would not want to kayak in a million years. Mm. It's way more difficult. At least cycling's in your own control. Well, as long as your bike's properly constructed. (laughs) Mm. We'll get to that. (laughs) And while Peter and Pascal kayak, Lloyd and Baha must solve a crossword puzzle. There are ten intersecting letters which will allow them to unlock the word locks on the bikes. And at the halfway point, uh, Peter and Pascal come across a boat, and they must choose whether to play a 20-ring version of Ring Toss for €1,500, or take a jet ski each back. What would you have done in this case? I would have gone for it. Because the the whole thing's only worth €500, so you're going to be... Working your butt off for three hours for 500 euros if you don't go for it. You, you've got to, surely. Surely you have to take every opportunity to make this task actually worth some money. I think this is the one way you don't gamble. Really? Yeah, because it's much harder than the other two. Oh, that's true. But but they don't know that, do they? Yeah, but you can tell how choppy the waves are. You've kayaked at that point 500 metres. 
you're on a very wobbly boat trying to play basically a survivor challenge. Yeah. It's not going to end well. Well, I don't know. I think it's worth the, the risk because um, it didn't take them that long to get there. They were there in less than 15 minutes, weren't they? So, you know, getting back on a jet ski... They weren't so worn out by the time they got there that they were like, oh, it doesn't matter what the challenge is, I want, a, I want an easy ride back. So I, I think I would go along with that decision. I think it made a lot of sense. Plus they're the first ones as well. So they've no idea how hard the next set of challenges is going to be. So, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely go for it here. I think also jet ski is the cooler tool to use as well. Yeah, it is, but it also makes you look a little bit lazy, doesn't it? I am. <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, it's kind of not the point of a triathlon, right? And they do choose the 1500 euro challenge, and they do really, really badly at it. Yeah, really badly. Despite only needing to land 1 out of 20, they land nothing and earn nothing. And so, with a bit of um, hindsight now, so we know Pascal is not the mole, but she did most of the throwing, didn't she? I thought Peter did most of the throwing. I thought, I thought she did quite a lot. She seemed to do the first, at least the first half. Peter definitely threw the last ones. Oh, yeah, he threw the last ones, but she had a fair go herself. So would they, would you do that? Maybe you would. I don't know. I think hindsight is, is a wonderful thing, but I definitely wouldn't be solid enough in my own aim to think I can definitely land one from a wobbly boat on a wobbly platform. No, but it's a it's a bit of a blind luck challenge, isn't it? You've got 20 attempts at just, just being lucky. And on the way back, Pascal the capsizes. And that looked really scary, didn't it? it? It genuinely felt for a moment like there's a bit of danger here. Yeah, they deliberately left it probably a good 10, 15 seconds before actually letting us know she was all right. Mm. And it's also kind of ironic for a Marine officer, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is true. And I kind of like it when they do stuff like this, where they um, they sort of break the fourth wall a little bit and you see that they've got a support crew and they come and help out and stuff like that. I like it when you see stuff like that. Yeah, it adds to the sort of documentary-style feel of, that the show has. Yeah. Which is nice. It, I like the tone of the show. Yeah. And they do return to shore after 37 minutes, and because Lloyd and Baha haven't even solved half of the puzzle yet, they do also help with the crossword. They were doing a really bad job on that crossword. They were. Neither of them is very good at trivia, evidently, as we no. saw with the, the shot challenger. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, neither of them have been very good at that. And once they do unlock the bikes, they realise they have no saddles. Bet that won't come back. <laughs> and they have two hours and twelve minutes left to do the final two challenges. And while they do that, Peter and Pascal have to find a key to a chest in a sand pile, and this will help them during the running portion. Yeah, well, it didn't seem to be that tricky to find the key, but I'm not quite sure why you would need to sift to find a key in sand, surely. It's, you'd just find it, wouldn't you? It depends how big the key was, because we didn't actually see how big it was. No, oh, but assume it's like a normal sized key. You, I don't, I don't know why. It just seemed a bit odd that they got the whole sand sifting thing. But then it didn't didn't seem like they were doing an awful lot of that. So maybe they were just digging it and they just just found it. Yeah, Peter found it suddenly. So who knows? Mm. And Baha struggles on the sand as you kind of would, given that those are not the best bikes. Apologies to Decathlon, but they're not the best bikes. They look like. Uh, hybrids to me, which is, which I have previously seen described as the worst of both worlds. <laughs> but Baha should be good at those, because he used to work at Decathlon. I don't know why I randomly saw his LinkedIn profile today. There you go. This is a kind of productive thing I do on a bank holiday Monday. <laughs> and yet Lloyd is the one who's left to fix his own chain on the brand new bike. Yeah. It's not the best advert for Decathlon, really, is it? And the chest, once Peter and Pascal open it, contains 20 golf balls. Which I love the fact that the narrator says, the golf balls will come in handy in the June run. And I'm going, to what? How? How are the golf balls going to come in handy while you're doing a run? Random? It would have been much funnier had they not come in handy at all. And had they just been a massive red herring. And they actually needed to take the chest with them. Yeah, they get to the end and she was like, so did you bring the golf balls? Yes. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Bully for you, you can go play golf at this brand new golf club that we found. And Lloyd and Baha can either take saddles with them or try and earn 1,500 euros by opening coconuts with a machete and filling up a half-litre jug. Which, in comparison to the kayaking task, was just ludicrously easy, wasn't it? This is not even a choice. 
not only is it really, really easy to fill up a 500 milliliter jug with coconut water, but also you don't need saddles. No, I mean, it'd be nice, but it's not life or death, is it, really? It's not going to speed you up at all, because you're not going to pedal while sitting down, because that's less efficient. Mm. There's a very good reason that when you see cyclists, they are generally out of the saddle. Yeah, it was just uh, it just seemed a, a very different level of difficulty. If it was a choice between swapping their bikes for electronic bikes with the battery, that would be a different story. But there's not even a chance that you choose the saddles here. No. Unless you are ridiculously bowling. Exactly. But just weird. And the only thing I thought was slightly odd was Lloyd taking a drink from the coconut water at the end and spilling loads of it. But clearly not enough to make it go under the line. So, yeah, probably nothing in that. And they return to Peter and Pascal with an hour left and just have the seven kilometre run to go. And it's at this point that I must draw your attention to a particular clue that I think I spotted. Ah, good. Did you notice the music when they began the run? Mm, I'm not sure. I noticed a piece of music at some point, but then forgot to check it out. It was a very interesting piece of music, especially given our conversation last week, because if you remember, we were discussing the, the wonderful music choices. So, for example, we had Paint It Black from the Westworld soundtrack, as we found out after the podcast came out. Yeah, so was it another, another piano version of something? Well, do you remember which one I pointed out last week? Um... I have forgotten. I recognised that they were using the theme from Avengers. No, that's right, yes. This piece of music that was played over the start of the run was the theme music to Marvel's The Defenders from Netflix. Ooh, okay. So we've got Aven- Avengers and Defenders. So there's a Marvel connection there. But then, at the start of the episode, there's someone who is described as the Guardian of the group. As in <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes. Uh-huh. Is that a hint to Peter? Hmm. Holy Peter, Michael. That question is even more important when you consider the the playlists of the Mortal contestants, which we discussed last week and how Spotify seems to think that I'm a middle-aged woman. And, spoilers, that hasn't changed in this week's Discover Weekly, as I discussed with you earlier. <laughs> because Peter's first musical choice is a song called Hooked on a Feeling. Mm-hmm. Continue. Specifically, the version from the soundtrack of Guardians of the Galaxy. Interesting. There are three Marvel clues to do with Peter. Not, but why? I don't know, but I would put money on the other five episodes before I spotted the Avengers theme, each featuring a piece of music from the Marvel soundtracks. Because there's some really good music in Marvel films and Marvel mm. TV shows. I haven't spotted any, but I would put money on it happening. Hmm. Now, that is interesting. Very interesting. It's just something I wanted to draw a little attention to, because I was looking at the the choices of the the candidates again, thinking they always put a hint in here. What's going to be the hint? I was specifically looking whether anyone said that they really enjoyed Marvel films, but it's a subtle one if it's true. Hmm. And if it's not, that's just really bizarre. Yeah, if it's not, it's really weird that they've put two pieces of Marvel music in in two episodes back-to-back. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. It's especially ironic given that the week before we started noticing these clues, I called the podcast Jill Demand Your Silence in a deliberate tribute to Infinity War. Yeah, even more of a strange coincidence. So, halfway across the run, everyone has a final choice. They can either play for 1,500 euros, or two people can take a quad bike to the finish. And if they play for 1,500 euros, someone must put one of the 20 golf balls into a mark zone, which is down one of the sand dunes. Yet again, this isn't a choice. To quote Jeremy Clarkson on Millionaire on Saturday, I hate golf. I would go for the quad bike every time. <laughs> yeah, at that stage, i go for the quad bike, because they're not sure how much time they've burned, and they're probably all getting really, really tired. So, yeah, I'd, I'd go along with that. There's also the strategic idea of, actually, three people need to cross the line. If you've got two confident runners, as you do have here in Lloyd and Pascal... It makes more sense for Baha and Peter to try and get to the finish line so one of the runners will be the third person. Because you yeah. don't want someone who is slow being the third person. No, I, th- I thought that was really good. So when I initially saw it, I thought, oh, well, they'll they'll have one of them. One of them will carry on running. Two will get on the quad bite and, and you know, Baha will just sort of trot behind or something. So, I th- yeah, I thought they figured it out really well. 
Although that does look in jeopardy when Peter cannot drive the quad to save his life. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so funny. They just, just them two on that quad bike getting stuck for ten minutes was just hilarious. It would have been a really funny mole action if Peter is the mole, and then he managed to lose the challenge because he got bogged in a sand dune. Yeah, it's it's not your classic mole activity, is it? <laughs> to pick the fast form of transport and then not be able to drive it. <laughs> it's really good. And it's Lloyd who crosses the finish line in third. The clock stops, and they do indeed win the two thousand euros out of possible five thousand, bringing the pot to twenty one thousand seven hundred and twenty five euros. Proficiat, well done. And they get in the sea. Yep, indeed. So it's around about this point that I'm seriously doubting Lloyd because I'm thinking that's a lot of effort to go in. You know, it would be so easy to just fall behind in the run and, you know, say I'm dehydrated or whatever. It seemed a very, very easy place to mole if you're Lloyd. I agree, which is why I'm slightly wavering on Lloyd, but I cannot for the life of me think that it might be Baja. Well, we'll get to it. (laughs) If it's Baja, I'm screwed on the suspect list. Yep, yes you are, indeed. And post the challenge, there is more beer, and they make some canine friends. (laughs) Yeah, and some good confessionals where I wrote down that we've got suspicious activity from Pascal capsizing, Lloyd's gears randomly jamming on a brand new bike, bizarre, and Baja constantly stopping. No mention of anything suspicious that Peter may or may not have done. And I I just wrote down, hmm, Peter not suspicious today? And they do check into a luxury hotel with four separate rooms. Lucky them. I know, that must be the first time all series they've had a, a room to themselves. They must they must have been thinking, great, peace at last, open the door. Oh, there's a frigging camera crew in here, what's going on? Yeah, I knew something was off as soon as we started seeing the guy introducing the hotel and specifically saying, oh, you're on the first floor, you're on the fourth floor, you're on the yeah. fifth floor, you're on the third. And you can choose whichever room you like. It's like, yeah, we know, it's the second challenge, get on with it. (laughs) And Pascal opens her door to Gilles, and she's in control of the second assignment. Each of the other three will be put into a situation in the hotel, and she must predict how they will react. For each correct guess, she wins a thousand euros for the pot. And Lloyd is at the sauna and will be joined by two Mexican men, and she has to guess whether he will leave within two minutes, especially after they start offering him nachos. It was so funny. It was just brilliant, because at this stage, we don't know how this challenge is going to go. And I'm just sitting there going, what? Why Why are you just staying there? And then then he, I just wrote down, he's taken the food. <laughs> it was just making me giggle so much. I was so puzzled. that I just had a note which said, does the mole have an earpiece for this so they can deliberately sabotage? I was just thinking, I, I mean, this one, I thought... This is really funny, but but very odd. And then we go into Baja's, and I'm like, well, that's really weird. It was at the Peter one where I'm like, okay, this is just not right. Something weird is going on. Yeah, the Peter one was the one where I just posted in our group chat a question mark and an exclamation mark. <laughs> I was so puzzled. <laughs> like, what is going on? But this also has very early US season challenge vibes because there's a traditional challenge that the US seasons always used to do at the final three which is the three questions challenge where someone hides in a house or a room and the other two have to predict what they would answer to the two questions and if they get it right they find the person behind the door if not they find a random Italian woman as did happen (laughs) this just gave me really early mole US vibes Mm. it just made me laugh so much especially the Lloyd bit when he's sitting there and I'm thinking Really? You're just going to stay there? And then he just, yeah, I'll have some nachos. Cheers, mate. (laughs) Brilliant. So she thinks that he will leave early enough, and of course, you know, he doesn't. And then Baha is next to be tested. He's at the pool and has left his stuff on a lounger. When he gets into the pool, his stuff will be moved, and Pascal has to guess whether he will confront the people who moved his stuff. And she says yes to this one, and once again, she is wrong. Pattern forming here. (laughs) <laughs> and then Peter's at the bar, and she has to guess whether he will give his number to a flirtatious woman. And she says no, obviously, because he's a priest. Surprisingly, he does. Very surprisingly, he does. So, two things that, that leap out to me um, at this stage. So, number one, why is a Mexican woman called Yaki? That's not normal. I'm pretty sure that's not a Mexican name, particularly not with that pronunciation. 
So what does that mean? That has to have significance. I don't know what it means, but it means something. And the second thing is, I wonder what number he gave her. Well, apparently he did give her that number. How do we know that? Someone worked it out or something. I I don't know. <laughs> let's just go with it. All right, we've got no evidence, but let's just go with it. This is the podcast where we've both seen the English subs for this week because they were up nice and early, but we are both really quite puzzled. Very. And all of Pascal's three guesses are wrong, so she earns no money. But wait, the boys were in on it, and they were told to do the exact opposite of what they thought that she would guess. So, in fact, they won the €3,000. Which was just brilliant. I really enjoyed it. It made me laugh. Making this the first and only challenge that they will actually get all of the money for. Yeah. And Jill warns them that there is still some money to come, and possibly something much more important. Dun dun dun. And this is the task that I suspect we're probably going to be talking most about. Mm -hmm. The mole book task. So they've all been carrying a secret since day one. The mole left a trace on everyone's mole book. If they put them all together, they can solve the identity of the mole. After three head-to-head duels, the winner will enter a room where the traces will be visible under black light, revealing a message from the mole. And as a qualifier, they play a riddle. Whoever answers correctly chooses their opponent, leaving the other two to face off. And the riddle is, what day was it yesterday, when it was four days before the day after Thursday? Yeah, not my ballpark this, and I'm like, no, whatever. But Lloyd seemed to get it really quickly, super quick, which is very, very impressive, I have to say. I mean, even with it written down, it's still, I'm still like, so that's that, and that, and so there's six days, and that's that. Ah, oh, I give up. Well, there was the the added wrinkle of the fact that you were watching it in English, I was watching it in Dutch. Yeah, that's true. So I was frantically trying to Google it to try and beat them. <laughs> So I was really confused. Yeah. Um, does it matter? Does it, is it significant that he gets that quick? I don't know. Would the mole want to get it? That's what I think. That's, that's, that's why I'm thinking well, everything I'm seeing this episode means you're not the mole, which is just really annoying because I thought for once I might have actually got you early. The most important thing for the mole is getting to the finale, I think. Yeah. So I think the mole would want to be in the first one. Okay. Because the first one is something you can properly control. Jenga really isn't. No, no, that's true. So he chooses to face Baha, and they have 20 seconds to memorise 50 symbols on a board. They must take it in turns to name a symbol. The first to get it wrong loses. While they're doing this, there is a €2,000 countdown clock counting down. The longer they take, the more the money drops, and the timer will not stop when it gets to zero. So how long they take could be a pivotal factor in whether they actually have a pot left at all. There's two schools of thought on this. If you're someone who really doesn't care about the information necessarily because you think you have good alliances, you forfeit as quickly as possible to get as much money in the pot. Yep. If you're sensible, you want to get to the finale at all costs. So you really don't want to lose this. Yeah, especially as I definitely wouldn't want to be left out of probably the season's biggest mystery. No, it could be absolutely pivotal. And, you know... I know you've said for a couple of weeks you should have your mole locked down by now, but yes, you should. But what if you're not the only one who's got the same suspect? You just want every little glimmer of information you can possibly get at this stage, don't you? Because you've got, that's it, you've got one more test to get through (laughs) and you're in the final. The thing is, I don't think that the information that Pascal ended up getting really helps as much as it could. If you ha- are between two moles, which you shouldn't be at Final Four, unless the mole is really good, it's not going to help you that much. But they don't know that, do they? They don't know what they're going to get. You know, It could be absolutely the one piece of information that, that they really need. I mean, it wasn't. I don't think it wasn't particularly helpful, but you'd, you'd want to go for it. I'm sure you would. And the clock stops at €1,840, Euros, which is actually pretty damn quick for them to get through 13 answers. It is pretty quick, isn't it? Yeah. And Peter and Pascal compete in competitive Jenga with another €2,000 clock. And yet again, it's nice and quick for Peter to lose at €1,600. He does lose very, very quickly as well, doesn't he? This has massive flashbacks to a trope that Dutch Mole was purveying for a long while, which is competitive children's games for the final exemption. They loved doing this sort of childhood game blown up to try and win the final exemption. Go Fish is the most the most famous example of them using this. So it's nice to actually see competitive Jenga become a thing on the mole. Mm-hmm. 
after they rehabilitated the image of uh, of Scrabble last season, it's nice to see them do the same for Jenga. Yeah, it's always good fun. Yeah, and Pascal takes both of their mole books to the final, and Lloyd and Pascal face the finale, which I'm lovingly describing as Kendall Chicken. <laughs> Whoever blows out their candle first forfeits. The countdown clock for this one is not two thousand euros. It begins at twenty eight thousand one hundred and sixty five euros and is their pot. And it goes down about ten euros a second. It's super fast. Mm-hmm. And at this point you have to consider the risk or reward, because if you are in the room with your mole, you know they're probably gonna try and take as long as possible to diminish the pot as much as is physically possible. Yep. If you think you're in there with a candidate, you probably split the information and try and get it over with as quickly as possible. But it's whether you can trust anyone anymore. Which you probably can't. But they do agree to split the information and Lloyd bails at €24,565. Which is still a profit for this episode. It is, yeah. They lose about 4000 4, don't they, while they're deliberating. Now, the only one thing I thought of that you might do different is there's a reason there's a barrier between you. And that's so you can't see the other person's candle. So what would stop you going, yeah, absolutely, Pascal, let's split it. Yeah, I've blown out my candle. I haven't blown out my candle. And then wait for her to blow hers out and then win it. I think they could both see the countdown clock. The countdown clock would stop as soon as someone had blown out the candle. I think it'd be worth a try, you know. It would be worth a try, and I completely agree that that's probably why the the screen was there. Mm. But I suspect they could probably see the countdown clock. And I'm sure Gilles would have announced it. Would have been worth a try, I think. So Pascal is the last woman standing, and she goes into a room with the ten mole books, including the four that are in her hand. And she must correctly place the four remaining books to see the mole's traces. And it ends up being a phone number, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. And she rings the number, and hears someone whistling. Which is not the clue I'm sure she was hoping for. <laughs> it's not the clue I'm sure she was hoping for, but do you know what the song she was, uh, she heard was? I, I couldn't place it, but it, I thought maybe it was the, the mole theme. I've had a reliable tip-off that it was indeed the Belgian mole theme. Yeah, I thought so, but uh, I wasn't 100% sure. I was hoping it was going to be something well-known that you could just figure out. but Or a so... song from the Moles playlist. Yeah, or or a song with, you know, the name Peter in it or something, which would have been quite nice. <laughs> so it's at this point that we're going to get a little bit meta, because I'm going to try and WhatsApp call them all. Eee, let's see where Even though go. they've not been online for over 24 hours, let's have a try. Sure, I believe it'll go to voicemail, but let's see what happens. Unavailable. Oh, Damn it. Disappointing. Well, you can always play the audio file I sent earlier that's got what apparently what happens if you do get through. Yeah, but I, I just, on the off chance, want someone to pick up. <laughs> I'm going, hello, Baha here. Oh, damn it, I've given it away. <laughs> I mean, it's not like we haven't been subtly hinting that we want to speak to someone on the phone about the mole. It would be very funny if someone picked up. It would. But the episode ends with the pot standing at €24,565 euros of a possible... Are you ready for this? Go on. €94,750. Oh, wow. I really hope the mole is on everything I've sabotaged I get to keep. <laughs> that is a huge amount of money, which means that probably we're going to see tasks for about €5,250 next week. Yeah. There'll be one task that won't have any money that'll be for information, probably, and then we'll have two tasks probably worth a, a total of 5250 just to make it around 100 k that they could have won. Amazing. And now it's time for the penultimate test. 20 questions on the identity and the actions of the mole. Whoever knows the least is out of the game, apart from the mole, who never goes home. And for the first time all season, no suspicions are shown, which means everyone's on the same person. Yeah. Pascal is the first person shown her screen, but sadly for her, it is red. And that really shocked me. Totally. I know we said she wasn't going to make the final, but getting the extra information and then Jill goes to her first... It's quite unusual, isn't it, for the first person to get a red screen? So I was like, whoa, where did that come from? I'd, I'd all, I was all ready for talking to you going, hey, we got that one wrong, Pascal did make the final. I've got a feeling that in Belgian Mole, the order is randomly drawn. Oh, uh, okay. Because it doesn't always happen that someone gets a green screen immediately in Belgian Mole. It's much rarer in Dutch Mole for a red screen to come up immediately. Yeah, it's very rare. But you do see it occasionally in Belgium. But it seemed like this week he had chosen to go to Pascal first. 
I'm not sure. It's a, a good question for us to find out the answer to, really, that. Mm. And one last thing. Did you notice her mole book was taken? Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah, it was. Gilles did indeed ask for her mole book again, which makes me think that that might, be the, might not be the last we see of mole books. It could well, could well come back next week. I don't understand why they would keep the mole books otherwise. No, other than for consistency. So next time, the three remaining boys face the finale. The Volodors of Pamplona, Waterfalls, Crocs and Musical Feature, before someone cuts the bull at the final test. Oh, it's so exciting. So, and Did you say earlier that they tend to do the reveal at the end of the final episode rather than making you wait for the reunion? Oh. They do, but I'm getting proper Find Out Next Week vibes. Mm. I suspect they're going to go against hype and they're going to do the reveal at the reunion. Oh, I hope They're going to do a Dutch mole, and they're going to have the recorded ending to the season be in the reunion. Oh, I really hope not. I want to know. <laughs> I don't want to have to wait another week. <laughs> and I'd like to say that this is the first time that we've seen a mole reveal in a bullring, but it isn't. A bullring has featured at least once before, because I know America have used it. I'm sure someone will, will give me the, the list of mole seasons that have used bullrings in the finale, but yeah, it's certainly not the first time. Uh, okay, could be right. So, where are we at this point? Lost, I think, is the short answer. So, as I said, I've been delving into the forums, and it would appear that there is a slight preference towards Baja at this stage. Um, I find found more people on him than than certainly than I expected to, but he's probably at about forty percent. Yeah. Th- I've spotted that there is a very similar poll to what we saw in in the Netherlands this year of it being pretty much evenly split between the three. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So so what have we got? Um, Things that I've spotted today. So obviously the phone number and the fact that Peter talks about a phone number, there's quite a strong connection there. So people have kind of hopped on that. There's also uh, been, as, as I think we've, we've picked up early in the season, there's been quite a lot of religious references um, throughout. There was certainly a reference to Genesis early on, uh, a particular verse in Genesis, and obviously we're leading towards the final episode where we'll get a revelation, won't we? So I will quote a certain Mr. Saunders when he said, but it's Mexico, it's full of religious imagery. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense as well. Logan, if somehow you were listening to this and it is Peter who is the mole and you dismissed my suspicion then, I will cut you. <laughs> now, my my favourite Peter theory is, and if it comes true, it'll be brilliant because I hope this will be part of the reunion show where they'll reveal it, is there are people saying not only is he being the mole, but he is also, and there are two conflicting theories or, or complementary theories, he has also broken every one of the Ten Commandments and committed every one of the seven deadly sins. So some people are saying commandments, some people are saying sins, and they've listed out examples like the fact in the Mexican standoff he killed someone, like the fact that he's stolen, like the fact that he's lying, like the fact that he's chatting up a woman. It's really interesting. I don't want to be the preachy Catholic here, and I don't mention my Catholicism too much, deliberately, because it really annoys me when people are very preachy about Christianity generally, but he hasn't committed adultery. No, it's dependent on on your words, isn't it, and how you interpret it. But I just thought it was interesting. I thought it was a very interesting theory. It's certainly interesting, but I'm not sure he's broken all Ten Commandments, put it that way. Yeah, it's down to interpretation, isn't it? Because the the translation was slightly different. It didn't say adultery. It talked about being unchaste. So I I guess it depends how it's done. Just quickly Wikipedia-ing it. The very first commandment that comes up is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yeah. There isn't really an opportunity for him to, to break that commandment on the all, and I'm sure it would have gone against his personal morals to have blasphemed, basically. Could be a very subtle him saying, oh, I worship something or other. I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not the one putting forward this theory, I'm just relaying it. If it turns out to be the case, I think it's really, really interesting. It's me being a pedantic Catholic. <laughs> So there's there's all of that kind of stuff uh, going around with Peter, which is, you know, has some credibility. And the whole idea of a priest being a mole, I think, is, is definitely divine. interesting. Yeah, it is. It's just wonderful. So there's that. Um, in the Lloyd camp, 
there are a couple of really interesting theories. So one which I, I don't put any stock in is people saying, um, we've heard Lloyd whistle earlier in the show and that's exactly how he sounds. So I'm like, yeah, okay, that's that's tunnel vision. But the other theory, which is quite interesting, is in one of the early episodes, you get to see Lloyd playing a recorder. Yeah. And there's also a secret scene of him playing a recorder. So there's two two references in, to him playing uh, a wind instrument, and they're saying whistling, recorder, maybe it's not whistling, maybe he's playing some sort of wind instrument. There was even someone saying it's a West Flemish flute. So that was interesting. Isn't the Dutch word for, for flute very close to whistle as well, or recorder? Just watching that secret scene you sent me earlier, it certainly looked like it was to do with whistle. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, so I thought that was interesting. That's an interesting theory as well. Now, the Baja stuff all relates directly to the phone number, and this is where I'm a little bit conflicted. I don't think, with a clue like this, you can solely base your suspicions on one thing. No, I don't think you can. Um, but there are some interesting things in the phone number. So the 0474 bit, is that prefix is all of Proximus mobile numbers all start with 0474. So you can pro- probably take that out of the equation, right? Which leaves you with... 90424. Yes. Okay, so Baha was born in 1990. Okay. He was buried in coffin number four, and his funeral song was number 24. Now, if that turns out to be a clue, then they have retrofitted that, because as we know, that number has been in existence for the last seven years. I was going to say, the the counter-argument to that is the fact that we both know that that number existed before them all. Unless it is one of a bank of numbers that they have. Well, there is that. And it could be that they decided to use that number because they went, oh, look, look at what's in there. And you'd only need the 90 for you to then reverse engineer it as long as you know you're going to use that number before you start filming because then you can put him in coffin number four and make sure he chooses song number 24. So it's only the 90 that needed to fit. This may be famous last words appropriately for the coffin clue, but I just haven't seen the... Suspicious activity from Baha. Neither have I, but isn't that what makes him such a good mole? Yeah, and this is exactly what I've been saying both previous Belgian seasons. <laughs> it's that I just don't see the suspicious activity. And then they turn out to be the mole. When it happens, I'll watch the reunion and go, oh, of course, but I just can't at the moment. I cannot bring myself to go, actually, you know what? Yeah, it's him. Yep. And I'm absolutely fine with it. Oh, there was another reference as well that I've just remembered. So I was struggling a little bit because the forum wasn't fully translating, but there was something about, as I mentioned, they were saying that um, they'd pick these digits up throughout the episodes, but there was some debate about the number seven um, and the fact that there seemed to be a lot of references to seven. um, And a theory was that the mole must have seven letters in their surname. And at that stage, this was before this episode, so there was more than one possibility. But but now, Bahador is the only seven-letter name into the final. So Interesting. It is. It's fascinating. And that that's why I am so excited that we're going into the finale, because I think for the last three weeks, I've been kind of comfortable with, yeah, it's Lloyd. I'm okay with that. That's really good. I'm really happy. This episode has completely thrown it out of the window because Lloyd has been not at all suspicious and, in fact, the opposite. And suddenly there's this evidence coming out that it's one of the other two, depending which theory you go with. So it's just so exciting. It's brilliant. It is. And there's only one way to really sort this. And I think it's time that we bring Logan back to be incredibly wrong, despite the fact he's got the best track record of any of us with mole seasons right now. We might as well bring a best of friend back with him. Yeah. Because we've been sitting on this for a few weeks, but it's time to officially announce that actually it's a two podcast week because on Friday evening we're speaking to Gilles. <laughs> and I'm so excited about this. <laughs> when Logan first sent over the first message from Gilles, which I have hinted at existing a few weeks ago by accident, I didn't even mean to leave it in the edit, but I did. I was giddy for a good hour when Gilles first said, is there anything you want me to do for you guys? And I'm like, hells yes. (laughs) 
It's especially awkward when I did say in the first episode that he's my favourite mole host, which I stand by. But just warning everyone, it could get a little ass kissy because I do love Belgian mole and she will know about it on Friday. Yeah, and and I am going to go on record and say what I thought was going to happen. This has become my favourite version. It's so good. Yeah. And the fact that we finally, we get a wonderful opportunity like this. And assuming that Gilles is going to be listening on his way to work at some point this week before he speaks to us, thank you so much for saying yes. Regardless of us speaking to you on Friday, thank you so much for saying yes. Because if nothing else, you have made these fans' dreams come true, basically, already, before even (laughs) speaking to us. And it's going to get way more ass kissy on Friday. So just strap it, everyone. Yeah. But... If you guys have any questions you want asking to Jill, please hit me up in the next few days because I'm compiling a list. I've already had some off Reddit and off um, various friends of the podcast. If you want me to ask Jill anything, doesn't matter how detailed the question is, I will ask it if I can. Because I'm really intrigued to see how much he can actually tell us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially as we know that he's recording the reunion the day after, so it's very possible that the only four people involved in the show really that know who the mole is by that point is gonna be the final three and jill so we're gonna put him on the hot seat slightly i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna try and worm it out of him but i'm gonna try and make him slip up slightly (laughs) i'm joking ish but yeah if you guys have any questions for for jill please let me know i'll give out the social handles in a minute anyway but i'm so excited yep this is gonna push me through the probably quite crap work week that we have this week (laughs) <laughs> I have four days of work, it's not going to be great fun so instead I get to speak to Gilles on Friday and it'll drive me through the week It's going to be good, so yeah get those questions in guys and then we will be back probably early-ish next week mm-hmm. to recap episode 8, I can't even say whether it's the finale or not because we, well the reunion's airing the week after so we're probably going to get nine podcasts out of this. Yeah, and I just hope we get the reveal at the end of the finale. I don't think we will. I think you're right. I, I, I don't think we will. I think it's going to be a cliffhanger. Yeah, I think so. But um, uh, we, we can manage, I guess. I'm slightly tempted to hedge my bets on the suspect list till we speak to Jill, to, just in case he slips up. I don't think he will. I have put a provisional numbers in there, but... Yeah, we'll see. To be fair, you can't really split it much more than you already have, really, this week, can you? So No, you you know exactly what numbers I've put where as well. I put 40 on Lloyd and 30 on the other two, just in case. I was considering swapping Baja's num- number out and splitting it between the other two, so it's 50-50, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But either way, it's going to be a brilliant um, reveal, because um, it's been a great season, and they've just played this perfectly, because... They threw, they've thrown it all in the air the week before the finale. It's fantastic. Weirdly, there is a connection to the previous season in the, in the final four episode. In that one, they debuted a massive clue to who the mole was. Ah, okay. In a gigantic QR code. Yeah, I was reading about that earlier. So it's certainly not without history behind it for them to drop a massive clue. But I didn't expect it to be this big a shake-up, basically. No, I, I honestly went into this episode going, yeah, they can, we'll confirm it this week. This will be the one where we're like, yes, did you see that thing that Lloyd did? That's the clincher. But no, didn't happen. Sadly not. So, is there anything else to say about this episode? No, can we just fast forward till we get the reveal now, please? And of course, the usual plea, if anyone can get us into the Café de Mole episodes, that would be great. I'm not going to even count my chickens now. We've got a Jill. <laughs> So thank you for listening to this Belgian Mall podcast. You can join us at the back end of the week when we speak to Mr. DeCosta himself. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our Twitter account, RTV Warriors, our own Twitter pages, MJ Harmstone for me, and Bulls Boy for Anthony. And you can also hit us up on Instagram, which is RTV Warriors. See you next week. Bye.